Big Boy gets all the glory, but there was a freight locomotive with an even greater claim to power, the Duluth Masabe and Iron Range M4 Yellowstone. It was built to pull more weight than any steam engine America put on rails. Its 140,000 pounds of tractive effort quietly outclassed the legendary Big Boy, hauling massive ore trains across brutal grades and freezing temperatures, all in total obscurity. If the strongest engine of its era vanished without a trace, what does that reveal about the difference between legend and fact? The answer starts with the numbers. The name on the builder's plate reads Baldwin Locomotive Works, a company with a reputation for tackling the toughest assignments in American railroading. In 1941, as the world was at war and the nation's industries pushed their limits, the Duluth, Missa Bay, and Iron Range Railway, known to railroaders as DM and IR, took delivery of a new kind of freight engine. This was the M4 Yellowstone, a locomotive created not for publicity, but for purpose. Baldwin's engineers crafted it to meet the demands of Minnesota's Iron Range, where the DM and IR hauled more iron ore than almost any railroad in the country. The M4 was not a mass market machine. Only 18 were built, delivered in two batches, eight in 1941 and 10 more in 1943. Each one rolled out of Baldwin's Philadelphia shops under wartime urgency, destined for a railroad most Americans would never see. The DM and IR itself was a regional powerhouse, its tracks threading through the forests and mines between the Masabi Range and the ports on Lake Superior. Here, the M4s joined a roster dedicated almost entirely to one task, moving millions of tons of raw ore to feed the nation's steel mills. What set the M4 apart was not just its size or its imposing silhouette, but the intent behind every bolt and rivet. Baldwin's designers knew the DM and IR needed brute strength above all else, and they delivered an engine that would become the backbone of the Iron Range, an engine built for relentless, heavy work, far from the limelight but central to the country's industrial might. Numbers tell the story of the M4 Yellowstone's true strength. At the heart of its reputation stands a tractive effort of 140,000 pounds, an objective measure of the force it could apply to a heavy ore train at rest. That figure outpaces the Union Pacific Big Boy by 4,625 pounds, a margin that is not just academic. In the world of freight, every pound translates to more cars moved, more ore delivered, and more profit for the railroad. The Yellowstone's weight added to its authority on the rails. With 566,000 pounds pressing down on its 16 driving wheels, the M4 squeezed every bit of grip from the steel rails beneath it. Big Boy, by comparison, brought 540,000 pounds to bear. That extra 26,000 pounds of weight on drivers meant the Yellowstone could harness its power without slipping, even when starting the heaviest loads on damp or icy tracks. Where the two giants differ most is in the diameter of their driving wheels. The Yellowstone's 63-inch drivers were smaller than Big Boy's 68-inch wheels. Smaller drivers meant more torque at lower speeds, a deliberate choice for the stop-and-go world of ore hauling, where brute force mattered more than velocity. Big Boy's design favored higher speeds for longer runs, but the Yellowstone was built to wrench massive trains into motion and keep them moving, no matter the grade or the weather. These numbers, 140,000 pounds of tractive effort, 566,000 pounds on drivers, 63-inch wheels, define the Yellowstone's identity. On paper, and on the rails, it was a machine built to outpull the best. On the Iron Range, the landscape itself dictated every engineering decision. The Duluth Missa Bay and Iron Range Railway's ore trains faced relentless grades, some climbing as steep as 2.2%, through rolling forests and rocky outcrops. Baldwin's engineers studied these profiles closely, knowing that a standard locomotive would not last a season against such demands. Their answer was the 2884 wheel arrangement. Two leading wheels guided the engine, two sets of eight massive driving wheels gripped the rails, and four trailing wheels supported an enormous firebox. 16 drivers meant 16 points of contact, each one pressing down with thousands of pounds, translating the engine's weight directly into adhesion. But brute force alone was not enough. The M4 used simple expansion cylinders. High-pressure steam fed directly to all four cylinders instead of the more complex compound system found on some articulated engines. This choice favored reliability and immediate power delivery, critical for starting heavy ore trains from a standstill on slick rails or in freezing weather. Simple expansion also meant easier maintenance for shop crews working around the clock during peak shipping season. Every ton of locomotive weight was distributed to maximize adhesion, not just to carry the engine, but to keep it glued to the rails during the hardest pulls. The smaller 63-inch driving wheels created more torque at low speeds, 
letting the M4 wrench 10,000-ton trains up steep grades without losing traction. Baldwin's design was a direct response to the Duluth Misab and Iron Range Railway's mission, move more ore per trip with fewer engines over some of the toughest track in the country. In the Yellowstone, every detail, wheel plan, cylinder choice, and weight distribution served a single purpose, conquering the Iron Range one loaded train at a time. Management at the Duluth, Misab, and Iron Range Railway did not hesitate when it came to the Yellowstone. The decision to order 18 of these giants, 8 in 1941 and 10 more in 1943, was a clear signal of faith in their new workhorse. Each engine represented not just a leap in power, but a strategic investment. The railroad's leadership, facing surging wartime ore demand, needed a locomotive that could do more with less, fewer crews, fewer locomotives, and faster turnaround from mine to port. Before the Yellowstones, the Duluth, Masab, and Iron Range relied on multiple smaller engines to haul a single loaded ore train. That meant extra expense, extra complexity, and more time lost to switching and coordination. The arrival of the M4 Yellowstones changed the equation. With a single Yellowstone at the head, the railroad could move longer trains, heavier loads, and keep the iron flowing to the mills that fueled the war effort. Purchase records from the early 1940s show the scale of this commitment. Each Yellowstone cost the Duluth, Misabe, and Iron Range upwards of $200,000, an enormous sum during wartime, especially for a regional railroad. But the payoff was immediate. The new fleet allowed the Duluth, Misabe, and Iron Range to retire older, less capable engines, streamlining operations and cutting labor costs. Efficiency gains were not just measured in tons moved, but in hours saved and dollars earned. By the time the last Yellowstone arrived from Baldwin's shops, the Duluth, Misabe, and Iron Range roster was anchored by these 18 engines. For the next two decades, the railroad's fortunes would rise and fall with the performance of its Yellowstone fleet, a testament to management's confidence in their choice and a clear sign that in Minnesota's iron country, bigger truly was better. Ore trains on the Duluth, Misabe, and Iron Range Railway stretched farther than the eye could follow, often reaching 180 cars in a single consist. That meant more than 13,000 tons of iron ore, loaded and ready to move from the Misabe Range to the docks at Lake Superior. Dispatchers logged these numbers as routine, not as record attempts. For the engineers and brakemen, this was the daily challenge, starting that much weight from a standstill, keeping it rolling without a slip, and coaxing it up grades that rose as steep as 2.2%. On those grades, the Yellowstone proved its worth. The engine's 140,000 pounds of tractive effort were not just numbers on a specification sheet, they were the difference between a stalled train and a successful climb. Crews recalled the sensation of 16 driving wheels gripping the rail, the locomotive straining but steady, never faltering even as the train snaked its way uphill. In the cab, the firemen fed coal relentlessly, while the engineer kept a careful hand on the throttle, feeling every surge and resistance through the frame. Reliability became legend. Day after day, the M4 locomotives moved these massive trains through bitter winters and spring thaws, over rails slick with ice or baked by the summer sun. The scale of the operation was unmatched in the region. No other engine could take so many cars, so much weight, over such punishing terrain with such consistency. For the men who ran them, the Yellowstone was more than a machine. It was the one engine that could be counted on, no matter how heavy the load or how steep the climb. Minnesota's Iron Range winters are legendary for their severity. Temperatures often plunged below minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, turning steel rails brittle and freezing switches solid. On mornings when lesser engines refused to start, the Yellowstone's crew braced themselves for another day of work. In the yard at Proctor or Two Harbors, the firemen would arrive before dawn, coaxing life into a cold boiler with nothing but a torch and patience. Even at minus 30, the M4's massive firebox could be brought to a boil, steam slowly building pressure against a world locked in ice. Maintenance logs from the period reveal a pattern. While smaller engines were sidelined by frozen pipes or sluggish lubricants, the Yellowstones rolled out on schedule. The engine's roller bearings advanced for their time, shrugged off the cold, while the oversized air pumps and steam lines kept brakes and whistles responsive. Crews bundled in heavy coats and wool gloves relied on the locomotive's steady warmth. Engineers recalled how the cab, built for harsh conditions, stayed tolerable even as wind howled outside. Operating in these conditions demanded more than brute force. It required resilience from both machine and crew. The Yellowstone's reliability in sub-zero weather became a point of pride. 
dispatchers could count on the M4s to move ore, whether the thermometer read zero or 40 below. This winter endurance wasn't just a technical achievement, it was a practical necessity for a railroad whose fortunes depended on delivering iron, no matter how unforgiving the season. For two decades, the Yellowstone proved itself not just powerful, but unstoppable in the harshest climate American railroading had to offer. On the Masabi Range, the sound of a Yellowstone at work was a daily fact of life, but few outside northern Minnesota ever heard it. The dm and IR tracks wound through forests, mining towns, and remote cuttings far from the main arteries of American commerce. Unlike the Union Pacific's sweeping mainlines, which ran through major cities and drew the attention of national reporters, the Masabe Iron Road existed in relative isolation. Newspaper circulation maps from the 1940s show Minnesota's iron range as a blank spot for national rail coverage. Most stories never left the local press. The DM and IR publicity department focused on reassuring steel mill customers and shareholders, not on courting headlines or photographers. There were no grand marketing campaigns, no traveling exhibits, no contests to name the engines. For the men who ran the Yellowstones, the pride came from performance, not publicity. This media silence had consequences. While Big Boy's image appeared in magazines across the country, the Yellowstone's feats lived mostly in the memories of railroaders and the logbooks in Proctor's Roundhouse. The geography itself worked against fame. Ori trains left the mines before dawn, rolled through wilderness, and ended their run at the docks on Lake Superior, places reporters rarely visited. Even as the Yellowstones hauled record tonnages year after year, their achievements remained hidden behind the region's pine curtain. The world's most powerful freight locomotive did its job in the shadows, its story largely untold beyond the Iron Range. As the economics of railroading began to shift, the lack of national attention would matter more than anyone on the DM and IR realized. By the early 1950s, the economics of American railroading had begun to turn against steam. Accountants at the Duluth, Misab, and Iron Range Railway poured over maintenance logs and payroll sheets, watching costs climb year after year. The M4 Yellowstones, while unmatched in pulling power, demanded a small army to keep them running. Firemen, oilers, machinists, boilermakers, and hostlers, each essential to daily operation. Every trip required tons of coal, thousands of gallons of water, and constant attention to moving parts that wore down under strain. Diesel electric locomotives arrived on the scene with a different promise. They used less fuel, ran farther between servicing, and needed only a fraction of the crew. Where a Yellowstone might spend hours in the roundhouse after a heavy run, a new diesel could be refueled and back on the rails in minutes. For the Duluth, Missa Bay, and Iron Range Railway, the numbers were impossible to ignore. A single diesel could replace the work of a Yellowstone at a much lower cost per ton mile. Fuel bills dropped, overtime shrank, and shop floors grew quiet as steam crews were reassigned or let go. Operating budgets told a clear story. By 1954, the Duluth, Misab, and Iron Range Railway began retiring its steam fleet, and the Yellowstones, once the pride of the railroad, found themselves sidelined in favor of new EMD and Alco diesels. The shift was not sentimental. It was a matter of survival. In just over a decade, the economics of diesel power had made even the mightiest steam locomotive obsolete sealing the fate of the Yellowstone long before the last one was cut up for scrap. By the early 1960s, the sound of steam faded from the Iron Range. Diesel locomotives, cheaper to run and easier to maintain, now ruled the rails. The Yellowstones, once the pride of the Duluth Misab and Iron Range Railway, stood silent in the yards at Proctor and Two Harbors, their massive frames gathering dust and rust. Company ledgers from 1962 and 1963 show a series of sales to scrap dealers, each transaction reducing a giant to a line item and a weight in tons. No preservation society rallied in time. No museum stepped in with funds or a rescue plan. For the management of a regional railroad, the decision was practical. Idle engines meant idle capital, and the market for scrap steel was strong. Within months, the last of the 18 M4 Yellowstones was gone. Steel that once thundered across Minnesota's hills was melted down, perhaps to become rebar or car frames, anonymous in its new life. The loss stands in stark contrast to what happened out west. Union Pacific's big boys, larger than legend and blessed with a name the public remembered, found a different fate. Eight of the original 25 were set aside for display, scattered from Wyoming to Texas and California. Some stand under open skies, others inside museums, drawing crowds year after year. The difference was not just luck or sentiment, Union Pacific, with its national reach and deep pockets, saw value in preserving its icons. 
Publicity departments worked with local leaders, arranging donations and transport. The big boy became a symbol, not just a machine. For the preservation community, the absence of a Yellowstone is more than a historical oversight. It's a wound that never quite healed. No one today can walk alongside an M4, climb into its cab, or hear the echo of its whistle. The story survives in photographs, engineering drawings, and the memories of those who worked the ore trains. The steel is gone, but the question remains, what does it mean for a machine to outpull a legend, only to vanish without a trace? Engineering greatness can vanish without a trace. Every Duluth, Missa Bay, and Iron Range Railway M4 Yellowstone was scrapped, leaving no museum, no monument, just records and memories. Today, the stories we preserve shape what endures, regardless of merit. As rail lines disappear and legends fade, what else are we forgetting to remember? Sometimes, history's real giants are the ones we never see. Share your thoughts below and keep the conversation rolling.